All right, so getting the thumbs up from John. We're still rolling. Everything is rolling. <clears throat> Everything is rolling. You guys doing good out there? Cool. So let's kick this off. Um, Photo Day Part 2, Photo Day 2010. Don't confuse that with Photo Day 29, which we did last year. That is, um, all the video is up at... at, at <laughs> I'm, I'm forgetting to speak. Oh, it's up there. chrismarkwardcom slash photo day. Thanks, John, for putting in the lower third. He's awesome. And um, yeah, you can see everything we did last year. And this year, it's a bit shorter, but yeah, having fun. And this is part two. And I have a guest that I want to geek out with about something fairly basic, which... I guess will turn out to not at all be basic. Um, you might know him from his show Maxwell's House here on the Twit Network. Uh, Ray, Maxwell, hi. How are you doing? I'm good doing here. pretty good. Thanks for making this possible. I've, I've, I've been watching Maxwell's House and, and every time I watch it, I go, one day I want to get together with him and geek out about something around photography. And um, when this photo day came up, that was like, okay, gotta ask you so um you are a color scientist is that true yeah the last i'm an electronics engineer who okay. for the last seven years of my career uh prior to that i was vice president of engineering of a 70 million dollar company but i wanted to end my career doing something that was uh, very near and dear to my heart i was interested uh, had been an amateur photographer since I was 10 years old and uh, was interested in the graphic arts. And I did some uh, support work and post-production work and ray tracing stuff for several commercial photographers wow. here in town. And so uh, I got really interested in color and specifically in the printing industry. So I went to work for a company called Creo, which uh, eventually, uh, shortly after I left, was bought out by Kodak. Okay. And uh, it did uh, laser-based equipment that did both computer-to-plate uh, printing plates and uh, very high-end proofing. So I was hired by the company to do color science and work with the color scientist who built the media at places like Amation, Kodak, DuPont, and Fuji. So... And the question that we want to talk about today um, is so basic that I'm almost embarrassed to ask it. What is color? That's the question. <laughs> well, let me, you know, I, I'm fairly famous for digressing into stories. So <laughs> we have is, about half is, an hour. <laughs> this is a short one. Uh, about 20 years ago, when I got interested in this topic, I decided that I'd study color for a couple of weeks and then I'd be an expert on color. Well, 20 years later, I'm still uh -huh. studying color, and, <laughs> and it is like a, uh, a great onion with layer after layer, right. and as you study it, you peel off another layer, and you find another layer beneath that, and uh, just so you know, uh, some of these layers can cause tears. <laughs> And I'm I'm about ten years into this process, and I'm yeah I'm at exactly the same situation. As soon as I learn something new about color, I yeah it's it's a bit it feels like voodoo. It feels like magic from the outside because there's so much yeah. to it. So where where do well, we start? How do we start? All right. Well, let's let's start with what is color, and you have to understand. And I'm gonna you know everybody tends to think about color as some kind of objective measurable thing <laughs> yeah and they think about it you know that's red paint and the color is the paint that's not true uh we ca the color in the final analysis is a sensation in our brains it's a subjective thing and it isn't a truthful thing in other words our eyes and brain the way it processes the electromagnetic radiation that comes into our eyes is well, for lack of a better word, isn't very accurate. It's, uh, it's uh, 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 a very subjective process that happens in our eyes and our retinas and our brain and, and gives us a sensation that we refer to as color. And by convention, uh, you know, we talk about this color is red and this color is green and so forth. But right, so the eyes, are, the eyes are not a scientific instrument. No, 
And let me ask you this. If I look at something that's red and you look at it and, you, and we agree that it's red, mm -hmm. how do we know that the sensation in your brain is the same as the sensation in mine? There's no way of knowing. I have no way to tell. Yep. Yeah. You know, uh, we can't look in there and, and uh, measure signals or something in our brain and say, oh, yeah, Chris is responding to this exactly like Ray is responding to this. Some people but hear me, colors, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. There are people, uh, there are people that when they see numbers, see color. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that hear sounds and see color. And that, uh, yeah, that has nothing to do with drugs at this point. That is no. mainly down to the way they're wired. That's right. That is a condition in their brain that there's cross wiring between the visual cortex and uh, and the audio processing part, or the visual, you know, other visual shape processing part, and uh, they have color sensations when they're stimulated by uh, either shapes and or sounds. Right. So it's it's quite an interesting phenomena. Now the the thing you have to learn in photography. Is that there for a color print? There are three things that are required for you to be able to see color, and color doesn't exist until you have all three. The first one is an illuminant. So we have lights of some kind. It may be studio lighting, it may be sun lighting, it may be lighting reflected off the clouds or whatever. But each of those different kinds of lighting have different spectral properties. In other words, uh, they have uh, it, all of light is electromagnetic radiation. It's in the same family with radio waves, but it's a certain band of electromagnetic radiation that runs from 400 to 700 nanometers. And I've got a picture of it uh, up on uh, our go to meeting right now. And uh, the 400 nanometers is the deep blue end of the spectrum, and the 700 nanometers is the red end of the spectrum. And uh, whenever we want to measure that illuminant in some kind of real meaningful way, we have to use a spectrophotometer that slices that spectrum into 10 nanometer slices. So, so that would then be a scientific instrument. That's right? a scientific instrument. Okay. Correct. And by measuring that, we can then map using a model of human vision and predict how a human being will respond, assuming certain fixed conditions about the level of the light and everything, because all this is dynamic. And uh, so it really gets difficult. Now, so we've talked about illuminant. That's the first thing that's required. We have to have electromagnetic radiation falling on some object in order to produce color. And, uh, and the illuminant affects the, our perception of that color. Now, the next thing is we have to have a colorant. So we have to have a dye. It may be a dye in a photograph. It may be a pigment from an inkjet printer. Whatever, there's some kind of colorant. And what it does is it absorbs part of the light in the spectrum and reflects part of the light in the spectrum uh, to cut out you know, part of the spectrum in some way so that only the red light or the green light or what have you gets reflected back into our eye. So, so the process of seeing a color actually means that the color that we see is, is only part of the spectrum that falls on the color that we see. So it takes, takes something away. It's a subtractive process, right? Yes, the colorant, and that's why we use, I won't, I won't go deep into this, but we use cyan, magenta, and yellow dyes. And cyan is minus red. It, it absorbs red, but not green and blue. That's why you mix green and blue. It looks cyan, mm. okay? Okay, magenta is minus green, all right? And so it subtracts out only the green light, and it reflects the red and blue light. Right. And then we have yellow, which subtracts out the blue light and reflects red and green light. So, Because when we print, when we have a white piece of paper, it reflects all parts of the spectrum. And so if we want to control the red, green, and blue light, uh, which is the additive process on a printed media, we have to... We have to have inks that subtract out only one of the colors, red, green, and blue. Now, why is that? Because the final third thing that we have to have is we have to have the human eye connected to the human brain. And it turns out that uh, uh, they did some experiments and they found out that the human eye has pigments in it that respond 
to red, green, and blue light. Now, color scientists don't say that. They say it responds to short wavelength, <laughs> middle wavelength, and long wavelength. They always have to be very serious and very, um, yeah, I know, you like know. doctors with their right. own language. Yep. Right. <laughs> But in plain English, it responds to red, green, and blue. But notice something. If, if you look at these diagrams, you'll notice that the red and green in particular overlap very, very heavily. True. Okay, and, and they overlap with the blue as well. So the way we see various colors is uh, by ratios. In other words, if, we, if I put up a, uh, and let me get down here to this one. If I put in a yellow light, a single wavelength of yellow light, it will stimulate both the green and the red cone that are in the eye. Mm -hmm. And that will create the sensation of yellow in your eye. All right? Okay. Now, it's stimulating two things at once. Now, if I go to a television monitor, which is an emissive device, I can make your brain get the same sensation as that single wavelength by sending out red and green light simultaneously. Now, I'm, I'm playing two notes in the spectrum simultaneously, you're, but your brain can't tell that. It can't tell the difference between me sending you two notes, two wavelengths of light, and one wavelength of light. It gives you the exact, if I stimulate the red and the green cones the same amount using two wavelengths of light or one, the brain can't tell the difference. And by the way, that's called metamerism. That's a metameric pair. Tips from the top, from the top.